Chapter 22 Don't tell me, Ambler said with unconcealed scorn and suspicion. You're a friend. You're here to help me. You've got to be kidding, the pallid man replied testily. I'm no friend of yours, and I'm here to help myself. Who are you with? Ambler demanded. The man was hopeless. His ineptness at basic field maneuvers was not the kind that could be faked. But he could be useful indeed as part of a as a part of a team, drawing Ambler out, lulling him into a sense of false confidence while others moved in for the kill. You mean my place of employment? I mean right now, right here, who else is out there and where, goddammit? Tell me now, or I can promise that you'll never speak again. And I was wondering why you don't seem to have any friends. Ambler formed a rigid-fingered spear hand and cocked his arm back. He wanted it to be clear that he could deliver a crushing blow to the man's neck at any moment. Who else is out there? The man went on. About 11 million Frenchmen, if you're counting the whole metropolitan area. You're telling me you're operating alone. Well, for the moment, the man said, reluctance in his voice. Ambler felt him found himself starting to relax. There was no hint of dissembling in the man's face. He was operating alone. In saying so, he was not reassuring an anxious subject, Ambler sensed. He was admitting an awkward truth. But you should know I'm with the CIA, the man cautioned, sounding nettled, so don't get any ideas. If you hurt me, it would be bad for you. The company hates paying medical bills. They wouldn't take it sitting down. So just put that hand away. That's a real bad move for you. Could be bad for me, come to think of it. Definitely a lose-lose scenario. You're joking. A frequent surmise and frequently erroneous, he said. Listen, there's a McDonald's near the Paris Opera. Maybe we could talk there. Ambler stared at him. What? McDonald's? Ambler shook his head. This some new agency rendezvous point. I really wouldn't know. It's just that I'm not sure I can stomach the local grub. If you haven't guessed already, I'm not really into the... He wriggled his fingers, cloak and dagger stuff. That's not my thing. Ambler's eyes darted regularly to scan the streetscape. So far, he had detected none of the subtle alterations in foot traffic that indicated that a pedestrian patrol... A squad of walkers was in place. Fine, we'll talk at a McDonald's. You never agree to a rendezvous chosen by the other party. But not that one. Tarquin plunged his hand in the suited man's breast pocket and pulled out his cell phone. An Ericsson multi-standard cell phone. A cursory inspection revealed that it had a prepaid French SIM card. Probably he had rented the device at Charles de Gaulle. Tarquin pressed a few keys and the phone displayed its number, which he promptly committed to memory. I'll give you a call in 15 minutes with an address. The man glanced at his watch, a digital display, Cassio. Fine, he said with a slight harumphing sound. Twelve minutes later, Ambler got out of the Pigal Metro. Pigal? The McDonald's was opposite the station. The milling crowds would make it easy for Ambler to maintain a discreet scrutiny of the venue. He phoned the man who called himself Caston and gave him the address. Then Ambler waited. There were hundreds of methods by which walkers could discreetly insert themselves in position. The laughing couple by the newspaper kiosk, the solitary sallow man looking dourly at the windows of his store for erotic aids of latex and leather, the young apple-cheeked man clad in a fleece-collared denim jacket with a camera hanging from a strap around his neck. All would move along momentarily, and all could be replaced by people of a similar profile who would avoid eye contact with one another, but who would be invisibly connected by a common coordinator. Yet, such an insertion always produced subtle disturbances, which an alert observer could detect. Human beings spaced themselves from one another in accordance with laws they were unconscious of, but that patterned their behavior all the same. Two people in an elevator divided the space between them. 
If there were more than three, eye contact would be scrupulously avoided. When an additional passenger entered the cabin, the current occupants would reposition themselves to maximize the distances among them. It was a small dance repeated hour after hour, day after day, in elevators around the world. People acting as if they had been trained in the maneuver, yet entirely unconscious of what impelled them to move a little farther to the back, a little farther to the left, a little farther to the right, a little farther to the front. Yet the patterns were obvious once you were attuned to them. There were similar patterns, elastic and amorphous but real, to be found on the sidewalk, and the way people clustered around a shop window or lined up at a newsstand. The presence of someone who was stationed at a position where one usually stood out of mere human velly, V-E-L-L-E-I-T-Y, I don't know that word, subtly upset the natural order. A sufficiently receptive observer would be aware of disturbances just on the verge of consciousness. To spell out what was wrong, Ambler knew was more difficult than simply instantaneously to feel it. Conscious thought was logical and slow. Intuition was fleet, unreflective, and usually more accurate. Within a few minutes, Ambler had satisfied himself that no surveillance team, no patrol had arrived. <clears throat> the pasty-faced man arrived via taxi cab, stopping at the corner just before the McDonald's. When he got out, he swiftly craned his head around, squinting above him, a useless gesture that was more likely to identify himself to anyone following him than it was to identify the followers. After the CIA man entered the restaurant, Ambler watched until the cab had disappeared down the road and around the corner. Then he waited another five minutes. Still nothing. Now he crossed the busy street and walked into the McDonald's. It was dark inside and illuminated with reddish lights, which struck Ambler as apt for a red light district. Caston was seated at a corner booth nursing a coffee. Ambler bought a couple of royals with bacon and sat down at a table that was in the rear third of the restaurant, but afforded a clear view of the door. Then he caught Caston's eye and gestured for him to join him. Caston had evidently selected his booth because it was the least visible. It was a sort of defensive mistake that no field agent would have made. If hostiles entered your arena, it was because they knew you were present. Far better to be aware of their presence as soon as possible, to maximize your own state of awareness. Only amateurs blinded themselves to stay out of sight. Caston sat down opposite Ambler at the small, blonde wood table. He looked unhappy. Ambler kept scanning the room. He could not eliminate the possibility that Caston was an inadvertent cat's paw. If there were a transponder in the heel of his shoe, for example, it would be easy to assemble a team out of sight. Visual surveillance would be unnecessary. You're bigger than your photograph, Caston said. Then again, your photograph was only three by five inches. Ambler ignored him. Who knows you're here with me, he asked impatiently. Just you, the man replied. There was a grumble in his voice, but again, not a trace of dissembling or guile. Liars frequently looked at you attentively after they spoke. They wanted to see whether you went for the lie or they needed to do more in order to persuade you. Those who told the truth in ordinary conversation just assumed they would be believed. Caston's eyes settled on the hamburgers on the tray in front of Ambler. You going to eat both of those? Tarquin shook his head. <clears throat> the American picked up a hamburger and started to wolf it down. Sorry, he said after a while. I haven't eaten for a while. Hard to get a good meal in France, huh? Tell me about it, the man said earnestly, oblivious to Tarquin. Tarquin's sarcasm. No, you tell me. Who are you, really? You don't look like a CIA agent. You don't look like any kind of field agent or law enforcement officer. He regarded the stoop-shouldered, soft-bellied man before him. The man was obviously out of shape <clears throat> and out of place. You look like an accountant. <coughs> 
That's right, the man said. He took out a mechanical pencil and pointed it at Ambler. So don't mess with me. He smiled. Actually, I was a CIA before I joined the CIA. Certified internal auditor, you know. But I've been with the agency for 30 years. It's just I'm the kind who don't usually get out. Back office. That's what you front office types would say. How did you end up at the company? Do we really have time for this? Tell me, Ambler said, an insistent note in his tone that was not far from a threat. The man nodded. He understood that the man he knew as Tarquin was not asking out of idle curiosity, but as a measure of verification. The quick story is that I started out working on corporate fraud at the SEC. Then I did a stint at Ernst & Young, except somehow that seemed too much like doing corporate fraud. Meantime, some bright spark in Washington figured that the company really was a company on some basic level and decided they needed to bring in someone with my peculiar skill set. He drained his coffee, and they did mean peculiar. Ambler studied the man as he spoke and again detected no deceit. So I was found by a rank amateur in the field, Ambler said, a complete desk jockey. I don't know whether to be amused or mortified. I may be a complete desk jockey, Tarquin. That doesn't make me a complete idiot. Quite the contrary, I'm sure, the operative said. Tell me how you found me and tell me why. A smile flicked at the corner of the man's mouth, a moment of suppressed vanity. It was simple, really, once I heard you were Paris-bound. As you pointed out, that's an area with a population of 11 million. Well, I started to think about the probabilities. Paris isn't a good place to hide out. It's still a major sector for the intelligence communities of several nations. In fact, it's pretty much the last place you should be. So you weren't here to go to ground. Maybe you had a job to do, but then why wouldn't you decamp at your earliest opportunity? Left decent odds that you were here because you were in pursuit of something, of information. Now, what would be the last place in the world that a former consular operations employee, one now classified as rogue, should make an appearance? Obviously, the Paris offices of consular operations. At least that's the way my colleagues would figure it. Last place you should be. So you promptly made your way there and kept a vigil on the bench across the street. Because the information you needed had to involve consular operations in some way, and the world of consular operations was the one you were most at home with. So it was just a feeling you had, huh? Casson's eyes flashed. A feeling? He was majestic in his scorn. A feeling. Clay Caston does not proceed by feelings. He does not traffic in hunches or intuitions or instincts or... You want to keep your voice down? Sorry, Caston flushed. I'm afraid you touched a nerve. Anyway, by your wonderful succession of logical inferences... Well, it's more a matter of a probabilistic matrix than strict syllogistic logic. By whatever screwy juju you rely upon, you decided to stake out one particular doorway, and you got lucky. Lucky? Obviously, you haven't heard anything I've said. It was a matter of applying Bayes' theorem to estimate the conditional probabilities, giving due weight to the prior probabilities, and thus avoiding the fallacy of... But the harder question is why? Why were you looking for me? A lot of people are looking for you. I can only answer for myself, Kasten paused, and that's hard enough. A few days ago, all I was interested in was was finding you so that you could be put out of business and irregularity eliminated. But now I've come to think that there's a larger irregularity to contend with. I'm in possession of certain data points. I believe you are in possession of a somewhat different set of data points. By pooling the information, establishing a larger sample space, to use the technical term, we may be able to make progress. 
I still don't understand why you aren't in your office sharpening pencils. Caston snorted. I was being stonewalled, is what it comes down to. There are some bad actors who want to find you. I want to find them. That might give us a shared interest. Let me see if I've got this straight, Andler said. He kept his voice quiet and conversational, knowing it would be lost in the general hubbub at any difference, distance greater than three feet. His eyes continued to scan his surroundings. You wanted to track me down to take me out. Now you want to track others down who want to track me down. Exactly. Then what? Then? Well, then it will be your turn. After I turn them in, I'll want to turn you in. After that, it's back to sharpening those number two pencils. You're telling me that eventually you hope to turn me in? put me out of business why would you tell me a thing like that because it's the truth see you represent everything i detest flattery will get you nowhere fact is people like you are a blight you're a cowboy and you're deployed by other cowboys by people who have no consideration for rules and regs people who will take the shortcut every time but that's not all i know about you I also know that you pretty much always know when someone is lying to you, so why should I bother? What you heard is right. It doesn't spook you. Makes life easier the way I figure. Pre-verification was never my strong suit. Let me ask you something one more time. Have you told anyone where I am? No, Caston replied. Then tell me why I shouldn't kill you. Because it's like I said. In the short run, we have certain shared interests. In the long run, well, as Keynes, K-E-Y-N-E-S, said, in the long run, we're all dead. I figure you'll take your chances on a temporary alliance. The enemy of your enemy is your friend? Christ, no, Kasson said. That's hateful philosophy. He started to fold up the paper wrappings into an origami crane. Let's be clear. You're not my friend, and I'm sure as hell not yours. Washington, D.C. Ethan and Zakheim gazed at the faces of the analysts and technical specialists assembled around the table at conference room 0002A and idly wondered how many tons of stone and concrete lay above him. Six stories of 1961-era construction the hulking mass of 2201 C Street. Just now, the weight of his own shoulders felt oppressive enough. All right, people, we obviously haven't achieved our objectives, so please tell me that we've at least learned a thing or two. Abigail? Well, we've analyzed his consulate downloads, said the signals intelligence specialist, her eyes darting uneasily beneath her brown bangs. Tarquin's penetration of a supposedly secure data facility in Paris remained a sore spot among them, a coup both stunning and mortifying, and the occasion for recriminations in all directions, and that was not a discussion any of them wanted to revive. Three of his searches were for info pertaining to Wai Chan Luang, Kurt Salinger, and Benoit Deschesnes. His victims, grunted Matthew Wexler. As a 20-year veteran of the State Department's Intelligence and Research Bureau, the INR, the policy analysts claim the prerogative to interject freely, the criminal revisiting his crimes. Zakheim loosened his tie. Is it hot in here or is it just me, he wondered, but decided not to ask it out loud. He had a feeling it was just him. What sense does that make? It makes the connection between him and these victims pretty damn clear if it wasn't already. Wexler leaned forward, his round belly pressed against the table. I mean, we had strong circumstantial evidence before, but now there can't be any doubt at all. I don't think the image analysis can be dismissed as circumstantial, Randall Dunning, the imaging expert, said quietly, as if only to put his demurral on the record. His blue blazer sagged around his slight frame. It places him at the scene, 
definitively. Matthew, you're proceeding under the assumption that we all agreed to make, said Zakheim. But something about these downloads gives me pause. Why would someone be investigating the backgrounds of the people he killed? I mean, isn't that the kind of thing a guy does before taking someone out? At the opposite end of the table, Franklin Runciman, the deputy director of consular operations, looked uneasy with the direction Zakheim was taking. He cleared his throat. Ethan, you're right that there are multiple interpretations available to us. His eyes seemed especially piercing beneath his heavy brow. There always are. But we can't pursue multiple courses of action. We have to pick one based on our best read of the evidence, all the evidence. We don't have time to entertain counterfactuals. Zakheim clenched his jaw. Runciman's question-begging summary exasperated him. What was factual and what was contrary to fact was exactly the issue to be resolved, but it was pointless to remonstrate. Runciman was correct anyway that multiple interpretations were possible. Still, Abigail's findings disturbed Zakheim for reasons he found difficult to articulate. Tarquin, whoever he was, appeared to be doing what they were doing. He was acting as if he was conducting an investigation, not as if he was the target of an investigation. Zakheim swallowed hard. It didn't sit well with him. The real kick in the pants is Fenton, Wexler said. Zakheim noticed that the analyst had not remembered to button his button-down collar. Given Wexler's brilliantly well-organized mind, of course, nobody cared about his personal disability. It's a definite ID, Dunning put in. That's the man accompanying Tarquin in the immediate area of the Solinger assassination, Paul Fenton. Nobody's disputing that, Wexler said as if speaking to a slow student. We know he was there. Question is what that signifies. He turned to the others. What's the latest on that? There have been some clearance issues here, Abigail said in a gingerly tone. Clearance issues. Zakheim was incredulous. What are we, the editorial board of the Washington Post? There shouldn't be any internal impediments here. Clearance? That's bullshit. He turned to Wexler. What about you? You pick over Fenton's files here. Wexler turned his beefy palms up. Sequestered, he said. The special access protocol is inviolate, it seems. Inviolate. I-N-V-I-O-L-A-T-E. It seems his eyes darted toward Runciman. Explain, Zakheim spoke directly to Runciman. Bureaucratic logic told him that the deputy director of consular operations had either acquiesced to the barriers or actively implemented them. It's not relevant to the purposes of this team, Runciman said, unfazed. Even under the cheap fluorescent lights, his dark suit, some sort of charcoal flannel with a subdued pattern, looked sleek and expensive. Not relevant. That kind was almost spluttering. Isn't that something for the team to decide? Damn it, Frank. You asked me to spearhead this thing. We've got all your aces here for imaging, SIG intel, analysis, and you're not going to let us do our jobs. Runciman's rugged features betrayed not a trace of tension, but his eyes bore down on Zakheim. We've moved past the fact-finding part of the assignment. Now the job is to execute the mission we agreed on, not to convene a bull session, not to speculate about hypotheticals, not to do archival research or indulge your idle curiosity. When a mission is established, your job is to make sure it succeeds, to provide operational support and actionable intelligence to our deputized agents so they can do what we've tasked them to do. But the picture we're getting, the picture? Ransomman cut him off with undisguised scorn. Our job, Ethan, is to take the bastard out of the picture. Paris. Half an hour later, the two men, operative and auditor, 
arrived separately at the hotel where Caston was staying, a curious cramped place called the Hotel Sturbridge, part of an American-based chain. Caston was obviously trying to insulate himself from the local environs as much as possible, and his room was large by Parisian standards, albeit boxy and institutional in feel. It could have been a hotel in Fort Worth. Caston invited Ambler to sit on a cabrio-legged armchair upholstered in mustard velveteen as Caston set about arranging papers on a small, glossily veneered desk, the sort of object that proclaimed its cheapness by its failed attempt to look posh. Caston asked Ambler a few dry, pointed questions about experiences since leaving Parish Island. Ambler's responses were equally matter-of-fact. A bizarre condition, Caston said after a while. Yours, I mean, this whole erasure thing. If I weren't in the bottom decile, D-E-C-I-L-E, for empathy, I'd have to think that the experience would be kind of unsettling. It's like some strange identity crisis or whatnot. An identity crisis? Ambler scoffed, please. That's when a software engineer holds up in a small adobe house in New Mexico and reads a lot of Carlos Castaneda. That's when a Fortune 500 marketing exec decides to quit his job and start a business selling vegan muffins to organic food stores. We're way beyond that. Can we agree on this? Casting gave a half-apologetic shrug. Listen, I've spent the past few days assembling all the data points I could with the help of my assistant. I've retrieved a good deal of your performance record at the Political Stabilization Unit, or in a way what purports to be a performance record. He handed a stapled sheaf of of pages to Ambler. Ambler thumbed through it. It was a curious sensation to see, in a desiccated and abbreviated form, the product of blood, sweat, and tears. It filled him with a sense of bleakness. His career, like that of so many others, was one devoid of any public profile. Its utter obscurity was to be redeemed by the covert heroism of his actions. That was the promise, the covenant. Your deeds, albeit hidden, may change change history. You will be history's hidden hand. But what if that was all an illusion? What if a life of obscurity, a life that had forced him to sacrifice the close human ties that gave meaning to so many lives, was without any real and enduring consequences, or at least any good ones? Caston caught his gaze. Focus, okay? You see anything that looks fake, you let me know. Embler nodded. So a profile emerges. You've got an extraordinary facility at effective interference. A walking polygraph gives you a lot of value in the field. The stab team snaps you up early on in your cons ops career. You're in the rough and tumble, engaged in the kind of assignments that the unit likes to get up to. <clears throat> he was not trying to hide his distaste. Then we've got the job at Changhua, successfully completed according to the files. Next thing, you drop off the map. Why? What happened? Ambler told him briskly, keeping his eyes on Kasten's face all the while. Kasten didn't speak immediately, but after a while, his gaze sharpened. Tell me exactly what happened the evening when you were taken away. Everything you said, everything that was said, everything and everyone you remember seeing. I'm sorry, but I don't... His voice trailed off. It just isn't there. Laurel says it's something to do with drug-induced retrograde amnesia. It has to be in your head somewhere, Caston said, doesn't it? I don't know, Ambler said. That's my life, and then it sort of rags off into nothing for a while. A lost weekend to another order of magnitude. <clears throat> Maybe you're not trying hard enough, Caston growled. Damn it, Caston, I lost two years of my life. Two years of mind games, two years of desolation, two years of hopelessness. Caston blinked, that's six years. 
If you ever get to thinking about entering the helping professions, Kasten, don't. You have no idea what I've been through. Neither do you. That's what I'm trying to find out, right? So save your whining for somebody who will pretend to give a damn. You don't get it. I cast my mind back then, and there's nothing, okay? Nothing but fuzz on the screen. No picture. A wave of exhaustion swept over him. He was tired. Too tired to talk. Too tired to think. He walked over to the bed and lay down, staring miserably at the ceiling. Kesson snorted, screw the picture, start with the small facts. How did you get back from Taiwan? No idea. What means of conveyance? God damn it, I told you I don't know. Amber exploded. Kesson was undeterred, seemingly blind to Amber's emotions, to the agony caused by his proddings. Did you swim? Take a steamer? The operative's head was pounding. He struggled to control himself, to moderate his breathing. Fuck you, he said more quietly. Did you hear a word I said? What means of conveyance, Kasten repeated. There was no tenderness in his voice, only impatience. Obviously, I must have flown. So you do have some idea, you self-pitying bastard. Where would you have flown from, exactly? Ambler shrugged, I guess, Chiang Kai-shek Airport outside Taipei. What flight? I don't, he blinked. Cathay Pacific, he heard himself say. A commercial flight, then. Cast an events, no surprise. A commercial flight, 12 hours. You have a drink on board? Must have. What would you have had? A wild turkey, I guess. Kasten picked up the telephone and dialed room service. Five minutes later, a bottle of wild turkey arrived at the door. He poured a couple of fingers into a tumbler, handed it to Ambler. Relax, have a drink, the auditor said stiffly. His brows were knit darkly and the offer was in order. The auditor had turned into the bartender from hell. I don't drink, Ambler protested. Since when? Since... Ambler faltered. Since Parish Island, you used to drink, though. And you're going to drink now. Bottoms up. What's this about? A science experiment. Just do it. Ambler drank, the bourbon burning burning slightly as it went down his gullet. He felt no euphoria, only a sense of dizziness, confusion, a growing queasiness. Cast poured him another drink, and Ambler downed it. What time did the plane get in, the auditor demanded, evening arrival or morning? Morning arrival. An eel of unease squirmed in his bowels. Knowledge was coming to him as if from another dimension. It was not at his beck and call. He could not summon it, yet it had been summoned and it had appeared. Did you do a debrief with the operations OIC? Ember felt frozen. He must have done one. Next question, Kasten asked relentlessly. It was as if he was proceeding through a vast inventory of tiny questions, like a bird pecking away at a cliff. Whose transients? Ambler felt as if the room was spinning around him, and when he shut his eyes, the room spun faster still. For a long time, he was silent. Like a gunshot in the Alps, a question triggered a small cascade that turned into an avalanche. Blackness overcame him, and then, out of the blackness, a glimmering.